Yes, I think we will start this. So I will start with saying uh, good morning, good day, good afternoon, depending on where you are in this world. So um, uh, thank you for, for joining, joining us in this important event, Local Democracy Talk, Morality Policies, Four Strategies to End the Discrimination Locally. My name is Johan Lilja. I'm the Secretary General of ICLD, um, and I'm so happy and so uh, uh, pleased to see all of you being part of this seminar. We live actually in a time where democracy in its true form are in decline. With that in mind, it's with a great joy I have noticed the interest to be part of this seminar addressing issues and questions that are the core of democracy to end discrimination locally. As you all know, the foundation of democracy is based on freedom of expression, freedom of press, citizens' right to vote, equality before the law, and then also the principle of non-discrimination. With other words, a true democracy have a strong human rights perspective built in as, as its core. And that's why it's so important with this local democracy talk and why it's so important that you and your ability to speak up are so important. Because the true democracy is not about the will of the majority. It's about giving all citizens equal opportunities, not limited by what you believe and in what who you are, etc. And perhaps it could be that we could say that Nelson Mandela's dream could also be our dream. He said, my dream would be multicultural society, one that is diverse and where every man, woman and child are treated equally. I have a dream of a world where all people of all races working together in harmony. But he also said something else. And perhaps that is the reason why I feel it's so important with this event and why it's so important with you. Because he said, fools multiply when wise men and women are silent. So we will not be silent. And we are so happy. And that is the reason that we are together here together today and why it's so important with your presence here today. But it's also so important with our uh, panel. We have to our disposal a fantastic panel, but also a fantastic moderator who will contribute to an interesting, important dialogue and discussion around morality policies and strategies to end discrimination on the local level. So with that said, it's my pleasure to present to you following team, moderator Helena Bureman, Deputy Head of Democracy Unit at SIDA. Welcome to you, Helena. Uh, and the panel, we have Govan Matsuri, morality policy researcher, a little bit of the ground of, of the discussion also with the research that we are done together, representing also the universities of Gajamada in Indonesia. We have also Shora Ismailian. She's a journalist, author, and a women rights activist from Iran slash Sweden. And we have also Carol Muga, former member of the Nairobi County Assembly from Kenya. Um, Welcome to all of you, of course. And then Julia Selström and Diana Bogelon, Roma Information and Knowledge Center at Malmö, Sweden. Welcome to you. We have Olga Ditsi, mayor of Björgang Town, Botswana. And last but not least, Sörjan uh, Kosetile. Uh, he is a H, uh, HBTQ activist and a former councillor in Gaborone, Botswana. With these words, I welcome you all to um, a great local democracy talk. But I also want to say great success in your local context to bring change 
to the most vulnerable. With those words, I hand over to our excellent moderator, Helena. Thank you so much, uh, Johan. Uh, I'll just say a few words before I hand over to uh, the first panelist, Wawan. Um, as you might know, the purpose of this webinar is to discuss why it is important to understand morality politics and how they can be a challenge to inclusion and non-discrimination. And most importantly, what can be done to counter the risk of that happening? Uh, another purpose is also, of course, to discuss new research findings and how they relate to different experiences, which we hear about from the panelists. So the central question is, how can decentralization protect against exclusionary politic, politics rather than enabling such politics? So today, as we're actually just one day away from uh, uh, the annual so Democracy Day, uh, I think it's important to remind ourselves why local democracy matters. Because the local level is indeed the primary entry point for part political participation and representation of citizens. You could argue that local democracy is the underlying basis for national democracy, or in the words of the Nigerian novelist and poet, Chinua Achebe, everybody counts in applying democracy. And ICLD is an important actor uh, in this regard with their mission to support democratic participation and change at the local level by combining theory and practice, such as in this webinar. I'll just say a few words about uh, how the Q&A function will function and then I'll invite uh, Wawan. So there is a, a question and answer function uh, for the audience. You can write questions there and staff of uh, ICLD, the International Center for Local Democracy in Sweden, the chat, or they will sort of post them through me uh, uh, in to the panel. So on that note, uh, I'd like to uh, post a question to Wawan, who's indeed a scholar, like Don said, based in Indonesia with a particular interest in political leadership, political populism, and decentralization and local politics. So Wawan, what is morality policies? Morality policies basically is a policies that developed by the government using some moral standard. And in that way, uh, many morality policies can just uh, exclude uh, some uh, of uh, members of our community, since you know we have a different moral standard from one group to another group of a society. So that's why, in our uh, view, uh, the emergence of uh, morality policies could be threatening to our equal uh, citizenship. So that's why then we need to do uh, uh, kind of a some understanding why this happened and how then in the future we can promote to get more inclusive uh, policies for our uh, plural society, Helena. Thank you so much, Wawan. So you could uh, summarize by saying politicians can draw on the shared moral notions of the majority or the perceived shared notions to secure elections, even if that means disregarding the human rights of dif different minorities. We're going to watch a video, so I'll hand over to uh, Clara, uh, one of the staff members of uh, ICLD. Based on age, sex, disability. Local governments play a key role in achieving the Sustainable Development Goal 10 on reduced inequalities. They have the authority to introduce local policies to reduce inequalities and end discrimination based on age, sex, disability, ethnicity, and another socioeconomic status. Our research on the politics of morality in West Java, Indonesia, find that at least 123 exclusionary morality laws and policies have been used to justify violence and discrimination against minorities at the subnational level. What are some examples of these policies? Among them, we found laws suggesting that LGBTIQ people are sexual deviants who must be cured. Other laws indirectly constrain non-Muslims from building places of worship in Muslim neighborhoods or explicitly forbid some groups within Islam from professing their belief. Why is this happening? Exclusionary morality laws and policies are often adopted by politicians who try to win elections by appealing to the interest of the majority. 
This tendency is supported by the presence of conservative religious groups with access to decision-making processes and intolerant voters who prefer politicians of their own religion and ethnicity. Pro-inclusion civil society organizations tend to have less capacity to organize an effective counter-movement against that type of politically driven coalition for exclusion. Unfortunately, this trend towards exclusionary policies is not only happening in Indonesia, but in many other countries, and it is directed at many different groups. So what can be done? Governments should intervene by reviewing all national and subnational exclusionary morality laws and policies. In addition, local governments can develop pro-inclusion training for its officials and pro-inclusion curriculum to be taught in all schools. Learning from other cities and their inclusive education can bring new <coughs> ideas to create inclusion. There should also be a law discouraging local politicians and political parties from using exclusionary platforms and messages in their campaigns. Meanwhile, civil society organizations, with the assistance of international organizations, can improve their capacity to open more spaces for pro-inclusion dialogues and to mobilize more public support for pro-inclusion policies. Our findings from West Java show how inclusive local democracy is everyone's homework. For more information about this research, visit the ICLD website. That was a very, very good summary, I think, of the research, but I will still invite you, Wawa, well, to. Can you briefly explain the, the key research findings and the policy implications, sort of like the globally relevant conclusion mm -hmm. for your research? Yeah, thank you very much, Helena. Um, there is a four uh, main research findings that we get from our study. First, the morality policies that happening quite broadly in uh, some local Indonesia, targeted to some uh, specific uh, minority group. Uh, it can be uh, the religious or faith-based group and also the LGBTQ uh, group as well. And the process of the uh, policies can be uh, kind of uh, occur in, in two ways. First, from top-down perspective and bottom-up. Uh, the policies that against the faith-based uh, group or a minority of religion usually are coming from the top. I mean, the local government get inspiration from the national policy. Uh, in this way, we call it as a vertical kind of a learning process. Local government uh, learning from the national government in developing policies at local level for threatening uh, or for treating the, the faith-based uh, group. While the policies on um, a sexual orientation, uh, especially in the LGBTQ group, it's uh, more coming from the bottom-up level from the community. Since the community, uh, because of some religious uh, belief, they have a kind of a moral standard in seeing uh, this group of people as well. Uh, that's the, the, the second finding. The third one is the importance uh, of a politician. So uh, actually most of the morality policies in Indonesia, especially at local level, uh, drive or started from the political uh, political agenda bring by the local uh, politician as well. And in doing so, the local politician will kind of um, uh, mobilize support from the people. And for sure, during the election time, they will use this kind of uh, uh, standard of morality in order to uh, uh, generate uh, support, in order to mobilize uh, support as well. And uh, it happened as well because the pro-inclusion group uh, at local level, they have quite weak capacities. So uh, when uh, the capacity of the civil society organization, when the pro-inclusion uh, group are not that strong, uh, the politician and also uh, the main group will having more kind of a room in order to push this uh, policy. And the last finding that we, uh, we find from our research, um, in some area where the socio and economic uh, kind of a quality of living are higher, actually in the support to exclusionary policy are lower. It means uh, we need also to develop uh, our society for having kind of a better socio and economic kind of a situation as well. When the education uh, is higher, when the economic condition is better, 
the support for more inclusive uh, policy, uh, the support from the inclusive democracy will be uh, stronger. That's the four uh, research finding that we have. And what is our suggestion? Actually, there is at least uh, four suggestions that we can uh, develop in order to uh, cure this exclusionary policy. First, the local government, supported by the national government for sure, need to develop a kind of a committee for regulatory review. So all the regulation at local level need to be reviewed in order or in uh, making sure that the exclusionary aspect are minimized. That's the first one. The second thing is, it is important to train our local government official to give them more understanding what is a good uh, kind of a policy in order to make uh, our people can live in more equal ways. So the training to the local government is very important. There is so many champions at the local government level, and we just need uh, to make them uh, stronger in this way. The third one is kind of uh, creating the electoral regulation that can giving kind of a disincentive for the local politician to push the use of the morality policies, especially to exclude this uh, kind of uh, a minority group. And the fourth one that we also uh, suggest is providing more assistance to the pro-inclusive uh, group uh, in our community to uh, make them more confident in voicing uh, kind of on the aspiration of more inclusive uh, democracy. And, and all these things, actually, we have kind of a social capital in Indonesia or in the, in the place that we study. And we have also discussed with the governor of the provinces at the time uh, to adopt some of <coughs> this uh, uh, aspect of inclusive narrative. I think that's uh, that's all the thing that I can say in this uh, States, Helena, hopefully. Thank you very much, enough. Wawan, for that <laughs> excellent uh, summary of the uh, conclusions and the recommendations. Uh, I'm going to invite the panel one by one to answer a few questions, and then there will be more like an open-ended discussion. So the first question will be for Olga, who, like John said, is the, the only woman major in Botswana in Juwaneng town, and an environmental health, uh, uh, environmental health officer by training. So Olga, um, according to this research, politicians seem to can that it seems like they can win votes and confidence by by appealing to the values of the majority, which may reflect patriarchal and stereotypical gender uh, constructs. As a young woman leader in politics, do these patterns that we saw in the video and that Wawan talked about do they resonate with the, the realities that you lived through? And have any of the listed strategies be, been of relevance for you? So you have five minutes <clears throat> to share your thoughts on that. Thank you, Helena. Um, do are uh, the appealing to the values of the majority? You know, do I how do I relate to this? And uh, as for for the, the the video, um. This is the reality that we are living in. You know, in politics, they have a language that you, they usually say, they say it's a game of numbers. So now when it comes to the campaigns, uh, us, I don't want to exclude myself, us politicians, we want to get the majority. And most, many times what we do, we focus on the majority what the majority believes in. And that's where the exclusions come in. For for example, if you take your background, because most of these things is about the, the culture of different countries. So for example, if you look at our, uh, you know, in our, some cultures, they will believe that women are not supposed to be in leadership positions, they're supposed to be home. And then that's where then, you know, the, the, the exclusion comes part come in because we will be focusing on what the majority are believing in and leaving the the minority but then it comes back again to us as, as politicians to ask ourselves ask ourselves this question 
why do we want these positions? Are we there for ourselves as individuals? Or are, you there, are we there to serve everybody, to be the voice of those who are not there? Because as politicians, we are seen to be the voice of the people. But then when it comes to a point where we choose whom to be a voice for, that leaves a lot to be desired from us, especially that we need to be the voice of the voiceless. That is the minority. So I think this video that we've just been shared really translates well with what is happening in the ground and the, 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 the strategies that have been put in place that are really quite relevant because um, we need a lot of training. There must be a lot of training, especially for the political leadership to understand why we do we hold those positions. It's not about, you know, the bread and butter issues, uh, supplying the roads, electricity. It's about the lives of the people that are leading. Are they free enough? So, uh, and also the other um, strategy that I, I believe that we need also strong civic uh, organizations that can put pressure on us as the government or as the leadership. And those have to be harnessed. Those needs to be, also needs to be supported because them on, its, on their own, they can provide education to the political leadership and the community at large. But one thing as the, uh, I want to emphasize is that once the political leadership is educated on, the, on inclusivity and also to understand but these morality policies are not working for, for the people that we are representing. It is quite important that as the political leadership that are trained on that because we have the masses that are following us and our voices have been heard. But then when I come as a leader and tell them, you know, explain to them why these morality policies are not working for everybody, that is where I think that will work very much for, for us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Olga, for sharing your thoughts and your experiences. I'm going to hand over to uh, uh, Julian and uh, Diana. Uh, Julie is a planning secretary and Diana is a, a community councillor of the Roma Information and Knowledge Centre uh, of the city of Malmö in Sweden. Um, can you, like you, you would have to share then the five minutes, uh, can you tell us about the city of Malmö's approach to uh, inclusion at the city level? And is the center you work for sort of a, a response to intolerance in policy or attitude? And can the center's work for the city be connected to any of the four pillars that we were uh, where we're seeing in the video? So over to you, Julia or Dion. I don't know who, who will start. Thank yes, thank you, thank you, thank you for inviting us to this panel, and we are very happy to be here. And uh, like we introduced us earlier, my name is Diana Bogelund, and this is my colleague, Julia Selström. Uh, we work at the Roma Information and Knowledge Center in uh, Malmö municipality, uh, municipality, which aim is to empower and include the Roma minority in the society. And uh, since the Roma are one of Sweden's five national minorities, we work to implement the national legislation accordingly. So uh, our work is rather a response to intolerance in attitude than in policy. Uh, however, uh, we, uh, there are many historical examples uh, for, pol uh, for policies and the legislation in Sweden that targeted the Roma and negative attitudes, racism, and the discrimination against the Roma is still uh, vivid. Uh, a little about this about the center is that we established in 2009, and uh, today we are eight people working here, both the Roma and uh, non Roma. And uh, we usually describe uh, our work in uh, three levels, and uh, the levels are individual, structural, and uh, discursive level. And uh, these are uh, relatable to the pillars uh, in the video. On the individual level, uh, we have a civic office, 
uh, which aim is to support uh, and give counseling to the Roma people in Malmö when needed in their context with the governmental uh, authorities. And we uh, work as the community councillors. We speak two uh, dialects of the Romani chip, and it's the Polish Romani and the Lovari. And we can also speak several other languages. Uh, since we have knowledge regarding Roma living uh, living condition and the historic and the history, as well as an understanding of the governmental authorities and legislation. Uh, this uh, integral competence uh, contributes to uh, bridge the historical and social established uh, mistrust that uh, uh, yeah, that exists between uh, the Roma and uh, the minority society. And uh, we also uh, support in meetings between, for example, schools and the social services and the Roma families or individuals. And, and I also think it's um, important in this context to, to say that we have also had, like as Diana said, the center has existed since 2009 and there has been a political um, uh, will to have this, yeah. to work with this question. So in Malmö, we've been working with the, the Roma inclusion for, for many years. Uh, and uh, we work with the Roma who are citizens of Sweden only. Uh, this is also a, um, a definition. So Roma people, there are also a lot of Roma people coming to, uh, to Sweden from other European countries, such as Bulgaria or Romania, uh, who stay here for three months, according to the European legislation. And that group is not, uh, it's not our um, target group. And so that is something that we in the municipality don't work with, just to uh, to be um, clear with, with yeah. that. But uh, we also, as the said, we have the individual level, and then we also have like the structural and the discursive level. And on the structural level, uh, we have an action plan that is um, uh, for every department in the municipality. And in, within this work, we, we work a lot with trainings, for example, and increasing knowledge uh, about this legislation, because even though we have a legislation and we have local policies, uh, the knowledge of this is quite low within the municipality and in, in general in, in society. So, so that is, um, the trainings are, are quite uh, important. Um, and there's also an advisory council in Malmö, uh, where Roma, um, organizations are represented together with the uh, uh, with politicians uh, where to include to include them in the in the conversation about the minority uh, so that is also about the participation and influence um, and then I saw the yellow note uh, um, we uh, and on the dis discursive level um, just an example uh, we try to develop cooperation with other minorities such as the Muslim community, the Jewish community, the LGBTQ plus community uh, in locally that share our Swedish uh, our <laughs> in Sweden that share our basic values kind of yeah. Uh, thank you so much and my apologies for uh, showing that infamous yellow sign but it's just to protect the, the time slots for Sergeant Shore and Carol who will come next after you. So thank you very much uh, Julia and Diana. Thank you. Uh, so now over to you, uh, Sergeant. You're a former councillor councillor in uh, Gaborone and an LGBTIQ activist uh, in Gaborone in Botswana, that is. Um, and you, as far as I know, you initiated a motion in uh, Gaborone City Council to decriminalize homosexuality despite exclusionary laws at the national level. And can you tell us a bit of your experiences of sort of that contradiction? Uh, and how it can be managed between sort of the national policy level and the realities in which you worked at the the local government level. So over to you, Sergeant, for your five minutes. Thank you, thank you so very much. Let me start by acknowledging my uh, the other panelists, which by so doing so, they made my work very, very simple, very, very easy. In Haburoni, while I was in council, I tabled the motion, even you said about it. Uh, there was a problem. 
the problem it was uh, an access to health care about uh, the LG, LGBTI community. The other problem, discrimination, the other problem, it was uh, uh, justice for all. So we pushed that motion, which the motion passed with 100% from all the political parties who, which were sitting in Habroni City Council by there. And then from there, we take it to the higher level, to, to the parliament. But in parliament, it was very, very slow to be, to be adopted. Even up, up to now, they haven't adopted, adopted, adopted it. What they did is uh, through Ministry of Health, uh, they improved the services to, the, to this, uh, minor, this minority communities through Ministry of Health. Through just the Ministry of Justice again, they really improved in, in combating this discrimination. The other problem we are having now is uh, the workers' rights. The workers' rights, uh, the opportunities and equal opportunities because some of the companies, if you are an LGBTI or you are an albino, sometimes they become they, they, they don't welcome you. Those are some of the problems we are facing at the moment in Bozoa. But the, in general, the country as a whole, I think is, is, is going the right way. Let me say that they are trying to go in the right way. But the, until they pass uh, the, the law, justice is not served. Access to justice is life and death. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sergeant, for sharing your experiences and, and your ideas from, uh, from Gabrona and from uh, Botswana. Um, now it's time to invite uh, Shora, who's a freelance journalist and writer, born in uh, Iran, but based in Sweden, in Mal the city of Malmö. There are lots of people from the city of Malmö in Sweden here today. Um, uh, in addition to being a journalism writer, she's also a women's rights uh, activist. <clears throat> so sure, the world has is quite knowledgeable, knowledgeable about the morality police in uh, Iran. Uh, could you briefly explain to us how morality notions have been used in politics at the local level so it was, what is the role of local authorities in making or upholding morality-based politics in, in Iran or elsewhere? Thank you so much for inviting me to this panel. Um, I'm going to tell you a story uh, about the morality police in Iran, and that includes uh, all the way top to bottom of the society. Um, so... Uh, I had heard this story repeatedly, uh, the one about my religious grandmother, who shortly after the re revolution in Iran 1979 was arrested in Tehran by the morality police, or as we call it popularly, the uh, committee. Uh, my grandmother was arrested not because uh, she wore her veil wrong, but because her pantyhose were too bright. And according to the female <clears throat> morality police, that arrested her to revealing. So neither her husband nor her five daughters had a clue of her whereabouts when she was arrested. And when she was released two days later, she testified about the humiliation she had been subjected to. Uh, the fear of the morality police was planted early in us girls and women in Iran. The headscarf uh, requirement, the veil, um, requirement for all girls from the age of nine was introduced after the uh, 1979 revolution and as recently as last summer the hardline president in Iran uh, Ibrahim Raisi ordered the authorities to improve women's hijab and I was not more than five years old but my grandmother's story as well as a brief uh, uh, interaction with the committee had cultivated the fear I felt every time my mother refused to put on her whale when we went out. Uh, it was This was the mid-80s in Tehran, and the generation that had made a revolution and 
thrown out the tyrannical Shah had lost the country to the Islamists. And in addition, there was an ongoing war <clears throat> with Iraq with no end in sight. And both food and fuel were severely uh, rationed. And there was a there was no virality and no room for resistance, uh, neither on a local level, not on a national level for resistance in during this period. And yet my mother always found a way to resist. And during the autumn and winter, she would uh, consistently refuse the veil and instead push all her hair into a brown beige knitted hat. And I protested uh, as a small child. I reminded her of the existence of the morality police and asked her to put on her, her veil. But, uh, but because she could not only be offended, uh, she could also disappear and at worst she would get killed. And that is the tragic event that happened to the young woman uh, named Masa Gina Amini a year ago, actually in two days, uh, it's the anniversary of her death. And for four decades, the morality police roam, has been roaming Iran, harassing women, degrading them, torturing them, and killing them. And all this started on the eve of 8th of March, the International Women's Day in 1979. And barely a month earlier, the revolution had won, uh, and the spring was uh, waiting to bloom both around and within the Iranians. And for over a year, they had done everything to overthrow the Shah's dictatorship and succeeded. Uh, the <laughs> anticipations of the new egalitarian and democratic Iran uh, that would emerge was really high. So celebrating International Women's Day had been planned for a long time, but suddenly it became an absolute must in the year of the revolution because the day before International Women's Day in 1979, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, uh, he announced that women without hijab would not be allowed access to workplaces, to government buildings, to banks, uh, and so forth and so on. So the demonstration on 8th of March was solely about this. Uh, enraged, hundreds of thousands, thousands uh, mainly women, took to the street and they had the clenched fists and loud shouts and the marches uh, in the demonstration that seem, seem to have no end. The protests continued for several days uh, and prompted Khomeini to temporarily back down on the mandatory veil and uh, the um, uh, morality police. Uh, but this was uh, symbolically because uh, this came also to be the biggest expression of discontent against the Islamization of the revolution. Eventually, the veil compulsion uh, became one of the very foundations of the Islamic regime and a compulsion that is maintained to this day, but the, by the violent repression of the morality police. You can see them uh, in the streets, you can see them in uh, government buildings, you can see them roam workplaces, schools, uh, banks, and the, but the resistance never died out. However, um, uh, it has been uh, uh, alive ever since that historical Women's Day. But last fall, uh, after the death of Masajina Amini, it culminated and um, it has been now uh, from over 40 years of being an individual, individual act of protest by women who refuse to cover all their hair, it has become a national-wide uh, unity that has been shaking Islamic regime to its core. And as a result of the protests, uh, the uh, Islamic regime actually took away the morality police from the streets for a couple of months. Uh, nowadays, you don't see uh, so many of them walking <laughs> around uh, and, and telling women to put on their veil. Uh, but they totally disappeared uh, during some months. Uh, now they are back on the streets, but uh, they they don't enforce the law as they used to. So they don't take you in and question you and beat you. Uh, they don't even have a, a place to, to take you in. Um, 
I think, sure, but, on that note, I'm going to have to interrupt you since your, your time is up. Sorry, but th there will be a discussion session later okay. where you could sort of, uh, I just want to protect the time um, time slot for Carol, who's the next speaker. So Carol, you're a former member of the Nairobi County Assembly in Kenya, and you're a community leader focused on a range of issues, including uh, inclusivity. So in the context of youth inclusion, how is the promote, promoting education and civic engagement contributing to protecting against the exclusionary policies? And could you mention an example from the context in which you work? Um, thank you uh, for inviting me here to be one of the panelists. And, um, and I think for me that in this day and age, we can still talk about exclusion of youth who are 75% population, 75% of the population in Kenya is youth, that we can still talk about them being excluded in, um, in nation building, I think it's rather unfortunate. And it's become like a revolving door to um, every election cycle. There are promises of, they will do this, we will bring you this policy that will help you, but they're just policies on paper but no implementation. The only, only implementations we see are actually the, the youth funds, which sometimes do not really address the issues that the youth are facing. Um, to just narrow down, say on education, you know, we have uh, a mismatch of skills. Our institutions of higher learning, some of the courses that they give do not match the job market. And so we have many graduates who are out here who do not have jobs. And um, and one um, and one of the things that this is happening is because we do not have people who are committed into the implementation of the policies that are on paper. Some of them are very good, but if they're just on paper, it doesn't help. Um, unfortunately, again, right now we have many youthful leaders who are youthful and actually youth. But unfortunately, these youth have just supported, they don't support the youth causes, and they've continued to entrench patronage and psychophancy because of because this environment, which you know they've been socialized and groomed, this is what this is how they've been groomed to come into power. So they're just supporting the status quo that has been there. And so there's need for radical, radical, radical shift in how we want to engage the youth in this country because it is a ticking time bomb. We are playing at the edge. And you can you notice that every election cycle in Kenya, there's discontent and there's, there's just um, threats of violence and sometimes actual violence. And majority of the people who suffer are actually the youth and they're the ones that are being used. One example that I want to give is that um, like in my county, 31% of the population of Nairobi County are youth again. And in 2021, just at the time of uh, just a, a few months to our general election, the Nairobi City County Assembly came up with a youth policy, 2021, a draft in response to a, a motion that was asked in the, in the Nairobi County Assembly. But it was so rushed, they, they, they launched the draft with all pumped, all pumped, there was no public participation. They did not follow due process. So that in the end, it fell flat on its face. Unfortunately, that regime was not voted back in. And you can see that now this regime again has to like start afresh. So it's a revol that's why I'm saying it's a revolving door. We keep doing the same thing, but no movement. We look like we are moving, but no movement. And, and I think that is really unfortunate. But I had discussions with um, the 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 Department of Youth in Nairobi County, and we are looking on how to again jumpstart and this time do it properly and involve the and involve the youth. Oops, I don't know what I've done. I've, I've oh. I don't know what I've done. I've touched something. That's something. I don't know what. Yes. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> Um, and really now engage the youth, the, the, the have proper public participation. 
and engage the youth from the grassroots. Because if you're going to depend on uh, the government and the leaders, it's not happening because we have the leaders there, but nothing is moving. So this is deliberate. And so we have to rethink the strategies that can be used to reach the youth that are actually in the grassroots. For me, I think that is where we need to look at to include the youth in the grassroots into inclusion, into policy making, and things that actually affect them. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Carol, for sharing your experiences uh, from, from Kenya and from Nairobi. Um, I do have some questions for the panelists, but I also know that there are some questions from participants. So I will start with some of them and then you know, I'll pose some, some of the sort of pre-destined question. Uh, the first question is for for you, Olga. Um, let me see. I could um, let me see. Um, just a technical issue on mine. Can Anna Maria Clara just could you repost the very first question, and I'll jump to the second, uh, which was uh, posed to Wawan and Sergeant. Um, the question goes like this. Um, Sorry, I'll, I'll jump back to the one for Olga. Uh, Olga made a comment on politicians playing numbers. And the question is from, originates from a participant uh, in Sunday River Valley in South Africa. And the question is, are civil society and uh, communities in Africa perhaps overemphasizing inclusive le leadership? And why politicians maybe have a hard time to play politics in a more inclusive way, respecting minority rights? Right, so that's one for you, uh, Olga. Thank you so much, Sandy River Valley for the question. Um, I think in our case in Africa, I think you'll ask it so well, uh, our biggest challenge is the culture and the, and the stereotypes that we do have. So it will find that it will be the very same community, before I come to the civil societies, it is the very same community that will be discriminating against the minority. And in that case, politicians will rather go or choose to go with the majority for the sake of being elected. That's why I was, as I was saying, for, some, you know, for, for us as politicians, there comes a time that we have to introspect and ask ourselves, why do we want to be in those seats? Whom are we representing? So now, uh, when it comes to the civil societies, um, I want again to emphasize that we, they need to be empowered. I don't think they are, in a way, overemphasizing. No. We need that more emphasizing from the civil society. We need the pressure. So that's why I think they need to be uh, 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 really empowered and be supported and be recognized by the government so that they can be the voice of the voiceless and even remind us the politicians because sometimes we tend to forget why we are there. So to have strong civil societies is really, really crucial. And then why are politicians having a hard time to play politics in more inclusive way respecting minority reasons? This is for the reasons I've already stated. You know, we always say politics is a game of numbers and people would rather go with the majority so that they can have positions. But the question is, why do we have those positions when we have uh, one of us, or most of uh, the minority people, I be left out, not, not being discriminated, not free, living freely in our streets, in our towns. So I think uh, I've asked your, your question. Thank you very much for, for the question. Mm. And <clears throat> thanks to you, Olga, for responding to, to that question. <clears throat> There are several questions coming in relating to um, the challenge of sort of creating political will or political priority or political space for that matter uh, for inclusion at the local level. This is an open-ended question. So <clears throat> either one of the panelists can just raise your hand and say, I'd like to comment on that one. Um, so what about Carol, Shora, Julia, Diana, Sergeant, Wawan? who would like to go first, or Olga, for that matter, if you would like to um, intervene again. So do we have a volunteer who'd like to say something about how to create political will for inclusion at the local level? 
Uh, yes, please. Uh, we do, yes. Uh, I'll first invite uh, Julia and then you are one. Okay. okay. Um, so um, just from our our perspective or from our experience, I think that we are like, uh, we're working with a minority, obviously, the Roma minority is our focus group. But at the same time, we're working with the whole society, like including other minorities, but also involving like the majority society in the question of who are we in Malmo? Who are we in Sweden today? I think that is our like discursive part of our work. And um, I think that has also been important for the political will here, that it's uh, about the city as a whole, even though we are focusing on one group and the Roma Swedish history is not only the Roma history, it's the, the Swedish history that we're trying to, to, to get acknowledged for in a way. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Julia, for responding to that. I see a raised hand from Carol and from Sargent. So why don't you go first, Carol? And then, oh, sorry, uh, my apologies. Wawan was first, then Carol, then Sargent. So Wawan, please. Uh, uh, thank you. I think the best way to create kind of a political will at the local level, especially for the local government is, um, we need to do kind of some uh, advocacy from the civil society and also from the campus, university, to give more kind of a, uh, understanding and also kind of advocacy the importance of the uh, inclusive society in this uh, plural context like Indonesia. Now, by saying so, uh, we need also to say that the best way in order to uh, kind of organize this uh, kind of a character of the plural society is uh, to recognize and also to give kind of a more room and also more space to everyone to speak and then bring uh, all this process into the dialogue and a deliberative uh, process. So by saying so, we can uh, we can help also actually the local government in order to handle this uneasy kind of a situation, especially when the conflicting uh, moral based aspect are uh, in our society. Yeah. It's my response in order to develop political will, Helena. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Wawan, for, for sharing those insights. Uh, now it's, let's see, it's, uh, I lost yeah. the order here, Carol, I think, and yes. then Sergeant. Yes. Yeah, thank you. In our case, because I just want to narrow it to like uh, the case of Kenya and the youth, I think one of the first things that need to happen is implement the existing laws because that would make a big difference, a real difference in how things will turn around from there. Another thing in my country is that the county and national government have failed to agree on whose function the youth lie, because there's a portion of function that lies with the national government, and there's a portion of function that lies with the county government. And so there, there's no cohesion, there's no uh, synergy in how these policies are being in, implemented. And that is why I'm saying some of these things I think are intentional because an empowered youth will radically change the country. And then um, again, our politicians probably need to distinguish between problems that are urgent and those that are important because there is everything is thrown out there but nothing tangible is given to you to mitigate those problems. So a lot of things are, to me, from where I sit, are intentional. There is no real intent by the politicians or the government to really, really empower the youth and make them useful in nation building. So I think that is where we need to begin and not um, implement the existing laws so that it gives us the startup push into going further into helping the youth at the grassroots. Thank you. Mm. Uh, thanks, Karen. Thanks for bringing up uh, youth as not not as leader of tomorrow, but sort of actually leader of today, and their right to participation and representation. Um, Sergeant, you also raised your hand in, in response to this yeah. question. So over to you, Thank please. You. Thank you so very much. I think uh, as a as communities, as a nation, we must start uh, not just voting, we must uh, select uh, the leaders who will be there for us. Example, 
I was I was saying uh, some minutes back while well, I was presenting is Habroni City Council uh, during our time it was hundred percent from different po political parties they voted this uh, this motion the motion passed through them through different political parties and it was passed with flying colors because by then I believe is the voters of Habron, they choose the right people. If you don't choose the right, the right people, uh, you are not doing anything. You are not helping yourself. In fact, you are doing things for us. Every in Africa, if you can see, a lot of people who are in these positions, they are not voted correctly. A lot of them that are, you can see we are having the problems in Africa. Those problems, majority of them, they are being made by the leaders which we, we, we choose. We, we don't choose leaders who are having the heart uh, for, 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 for his own people. When you are talking about the minority groups, they are the ones, they go there, they vote. Even them, they vote, these minority groups. But during the elections, they will vote for someone who's, who is not with them totally. That is the problem we are having in Africa as a whole, the way I've been observing Africa. People must change. They must now vote for the people who are with them. Okay. Thank you so much. Hmm. Uh, thanks, Sergeant, for bringing up actually the responsibility of, of the voters uh, in addition to the responsibilities of the political actors themselves. Um, there are some questions about um, if any of you know of examples of inclusive, inclusivity training of policymakers, what that could look like. And um, a related question, um, uh, if uh, incentives for politicians to appeal to the majority population uh, to win election, is it too strong? So do we have any volunteers who could respond to examples of inclusivity, inclusivity training? Uh, and uh, <clears throat> the second question of whether incentives to appeal to the majority, to their perceived or real prejudices against minor, min, minorities, if those incentives are too strong. And then maybe I'll add what can be done to um, increase the incentives to do differently, a little bit of what a sergeant was just talking about. So do we have any volunteers to respond to either or both of those two questions? Please just raise, raise your hand or uh, Shora, please. I'll hand over to you. Thank you. The, I think the, the story of Iran is very different from the, the other countries that we are talking about here because Iran is a total uh, theocracy and, and dictatorship. And uh, so uh, how people have been trying to, to get rid of the morality police and, and the, the laws imposed on, on them is very different from, from the other cases here. But uh, I just want to, to share with you that um, one year after the the this revolution called Women Life Freedom started in Iran, uh, women are walking around uh, without the veil, uh, not being afraid anymore of the morality police that have that they've been afraid of all their lives and. And as a result of, of this uprising, as a result of these uh, demonstrations that have been all over the country, uh, they are actually saying that not, not only are they subjected to violence from the morality police nowadays, but also they, they, they seem to have changed the society's views on uh, on the morality of how to dress, how to be as a woman and not. Because uh, I, I spoke to some activists the other day, they say we can even walk in a very traditional and conservative place as Tehran's bazaar, and nobody, not even normal people that, that a year ago would have told us, put on your veil or, or um, manage yourself in a better way, Normal people that that have comments on how women dress and how they they um, walk around, that is also gone. Uh, so all this uh, up the, the uprising has actually started to democratize also the the societal view on on uh, how how to walk around and and women's freedom and so on. 
Uh, thank you much uh, so much, uh, Shora, for sharing that uh, sort of possibly unexpected shift in norms. Hope it does sound very reassuring. Um, so on the questions of um, um, examples of, well, this is maybe like an example of um, not a training, but something that happened anyway. Uh, so do we have any examples of um, uh, inclusivity trainings that you would like to share? Or for that matter, if somebody would like to speak to the question about how you can lower in, in incentives uh, to appeal to the majority for politicians. Yes, Wawan, please. Yep. Um, um, I think I would like to respond both of. First, um, in the case of Indonesia, yeah, you, you know, first it depends on the context. Uh, uh, in the context where the uh, society are uh, kind of a holding very strong aspect of a morality uh, based on religious, probably, or the local norm. The incentive for politicians to use this kind of perspective in order to appeal for uh, political gain, especially for in the uh, voting period, uh, will be a very kind of a strong as well. Uh, so, I mean, a uh, politician tends uh, to do kind of a very pragmatic way in order to win the election rather than to give kind of a better and different understanding to the people of uh, what is the differences and how is the important uh, to kind of uh, include uh, all the uh, segment of society into uh, a system. So um, in this uh, kind of situation, and the best thing to do is uh, how then the, the the committee of the election can develop uh, a better regulation in order to pursue to push the politician to say more on a programmatic aspect rather than using the identity politics rather than using kind of a uh, kind of using the emotional uh, aspect of morality in order to win the election and also. Uh, it is very important for the civil society as well, for the pro-inclusive uh, uh, citizenship uh, element as well, uh, to promote more and more uh, ways that in order to win the election, and the use of a kind of a programmatic aspect, uh, more kind of a, a socio-economic uh, aspect is more valuable for our society rather than using only uh, aspect of a, a morality or kind of a, a identity politics. Uh, that's my first response. The for the second response, uh, probably this is our big homework, how to develop kind of a module or a curriculum of training and that we can use for the um, local government official in order not to act first, but to understand how to develop more inclusive citizenship, how to develop more uh, kind of inclusive democracy to our uh, policymakers at local level. So giving them more understanding on it and why it is important uh, uh, to be uh, delivered or to be kind of uh, held as a principle of policy will be the best way at the first hand. Uh, Secondly, after we give kind of a more understanding, probably we need also to develop more concrete pilot project action or capstone project, how then to address uh, the different society, different group of society into uh, kind of a into into a kind of a more integrated system that is more equal. So I mean, uh, it's it will be our uh, homework as well, especially at the local level, because you know the capacity of the local government official uh, are quite different from one place to another place. So by 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 kind of uh, formulating uh, this kind of uh, quote unquote standard uh, curriculum, probably will be helpful as well in the future. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Elena. Thank, thank you so much. Um, we also had a couple of questions about um, something which Carol touched upon, but if either Carol or any of the other panelists could talk a little bit about uh, strategies that are being in place, uh, being put in place to ensure youth empowerment. I don't know if maybe if there's something from the city of Malmö to share, or from uh, Sergeant, or from uh, from well, I mentioned Carol, but also from Olga or whoever would like to speak to. Uh, strategies to uh, promote youth empowerment. Uh, 
I can go first then. Yes, please. I um I think one of the things that really need to happen is that we um we must invest in the developments of its human capital through policies and actions that expand the education and skills and the opportunities that are afforded to the youth in any country. And also um, the youth need to speak up, speak out. Because without their input into what is being charted for them, then we find ourselves doing things that we think are good for them. And um, we, politicians, community, government must listen to what the youth are saying so that this collective voice and um, and the things that, the policies that we have put in place to help bring, uh, help empower them, we are now able to channel them into proper use because that is the greatest thing about youth development. The strategies are there, but the voice of the youth is not there. We, we, we are doing things that we think are good for them. And I think if we marry the two, if they bring their, their opinions and we listen to them and we also do what we as adults think and marry the two, then we will have cohesion in our communities. Mm. There's actually a follow-up question for you, um, uh, Carol, um, about, it goes like this, what is the Nairobi government doing to ensure that youth at the grassroots holds government accountable for service delivery? Um, again, I come back to the failed policy, draft policy that was drafted. And in that there was, um, there was to be uh, an establishment of a youth advisory council, which were going to, they were going to do like mini elections in the grassroots from every ward. Every ward would have a representative sitting in that advisory council, but that has not come to pass. But we are looking, um, we are having a sit down with the, the county executive to see how we want to do the public participation. Because again, you know that pu public participation can be a sham. They can just invite the ones that they want to speak out and the things they want to hear. So we want to do a proper public participation where the youth in the grassroots actually speaking about the things they, they want. And then how then do we, do, do we come up with this advisory council? It should not come from the top. It should come from the youth themselves so that they feel represented because this advisory council will be the voice of the youth in the county. And so we are looking at uh, ways and we are, we are hoping that we know the when it comes to youth, the resources are meager. And, and um, we want to look that even in the budget process, that the things of the youth are also taken seriously because you find that the funding for youth uh, engagement, participation, public participation, very little is given. And the politicians and the executive people will call the, the organizations or the youth that they like. And so this is a process that needs to be very open and very deliberate and very honest if we really, really want to include the youthful voices. And if we do not, it is gonna catch up with us because this is a very huge percentage of the population of this nation. And I, and I believe every other nation, the youth percentage in, in countries in Africa are too big for us to now ignore. If we do not do what we are saying, if it just becomes a talk shop, then we'll only have ourselves to blame when things go south. Yeah, and mm. so those are the things that, that um, Nairobi County government is, is trying to do to mitigate that. Yeah. Thank you so much, Carol. I can see Sorogent raising her hand, but I think Julia and Diana, did, you had your hands raised previously. Is this still, would you still like to comment? Yeah, we can just- No, please do, and then, oh, so it's your turn, sorry. So over to you. Yeah, I think one, uh, one thing that we see a lot here is that uh, Roma um, youth is, um, scared or are not usually open with their Roma identity in schools. Some are, but 
there is still a fear of being uh, reprimanded or have repercussions for for being part of the minority. So I think that is uh, a true um, point in uh, in Sweden for Roma to be able to be open with their identity and to be proud yeah. of being a Roma. Exactly, and also in that same area uh, that teachers and uh, school personnel are aware of the Roma history in Sweden, uh, which is still, uh, the competence is quite low. So the understanding for um, the difficulties with being open with your uh, identity is something that we raising awareness about that. Uh, and then I think that uh, what Carol also said, like to uh, develop um, ways of use to have uh, influence and um, participation in the in the um, in the political life or in in the policy making. I think that is an area of development also in this question. Uh, yeah, definitely. Hmm. Thank you so much, uh, and Sergeant, your comment on youth empowerment, please. Yes, uh, my comment on the youth empowerment is, I agree with the panelist, but uh, I would like to expand it a little bit to add the disability disability and uh, the, the woman in Africa, those are the vulnerable groups, which are, they have left, uh, they've been left behind, especially the disability people, community, they've been left behind. If you can include them as we deal with youth, uh, it will be helpful for those groups, for those two groups uh, I've added. Thank you so much. Mm, thank you, Sergeant, for that addition. Uh, we have a question that is directed to Wawan or Sergeant or both or any of the panelists. Um, the question goes like this. Um, to the majority or parts of the majority, same sex sexual orientation can somewhat present an act of immorality. At the same time, the absence of legislative provisions in the protection in the protection of the LGBTIQ community's human rights, is definitely discriminatory in nature. And what would be the best sort of course of action to sort of balancing these two diametrically opposing and contrasting phenomena? Maybe Wawan, would you like to answer first? Um, yes, for sure. Um, in a society where the morality uh, elements are quite contrasting. I mean, where there is a, so many different view of uh, morality aspect in seeing some things, it will be a very big dilemma as well, not only for the society, but also for the policy makers. So in the best way then how to, uh, to, to balance all these things. In my perspective, the best way to do is uh, in the state, uh, either at the national or local level, just need to open the dialogue. Uh, need to open the arena so all the things that is still contradictory uh, in contrast need to be kind of a, a put in a more a deliberative way from time to time and also uh, we need to make sure that where there is a case uh, for example uh, one case that is against quote unquote and uh, the dominant uh, value of morality the state must uh, protect uh, this group as well so there will be no kind of a, a kind of societal judgment uh, if there is some kind of a, a differences in terms of the modality. Uh, for sure, uh, it's all these things are need times, but the best way is the state must open the room for the discussion, the room for dialogue, for the deliberation, and also making sure that this process happen in a more equal way and also uh, kind of a respecting uh, all the view that is quite different uh, uh, in our society. That's my response, uh, Helena. It's not not black and white uh, kind of a situation for sure. Yeah. No, of course not. No, thanks for adding that nuance. So, Sergeant, mm -hmm. would you also like to respond to this question since it was posed to you and Wawan? And and by all means, the other panelists, you're also free to respond if you want to. Yeah. No, I think. Uh, uh, the way he, he, he answered it, uh, I agree with him. I can't have more comment on it, I agree with him. We need to to have a dialogue as a nations, as nations throughout the world. We need to have a dialogue. That is the best way to go. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And any other panelists who would like to respond to that particular one? And please raise your hand. 
Uh, I'll throw in a, a question related to um, a different topic that hasn't been covered yet, which is about um, uh, sort of international support. Uh, so the question is, uh, what would be needed from international donors and support organizations that would like to contribute to sort of a strengthening of local democracy, including inclusionary uh, policies? So what could sort of the international community do better in this regard? And, you know, whoever would like to volunteer, you're more than welcome. Uh, Olga, please. Um, thank you. Um, I think the support that uh, the international community can uh, have, you know, put firstly is on the expertise. You can see that in the first world countries, some of them are already so much advanced when it comes to this, uh, when it comes to inclusivity. And then secondly, again, is the funding. Because in some countries, you know, it's about the priorities. Where do we have our priorities? Funding for what? Funding for the trainings that we're talking about right now. When we talk about training of the political leadership, when you talk about these dialogues, they need to be coordinated, they need funding. So I think that's where the international support will really, really, it's really, really needed uh, in the in this case. Um, um, thank you very much. I don't want to be take so much time. Uh, thank you, Olga. And over to you, Carol. What do you think the international sort of the donor community could do better in supporting local democracy and inclusion, inclusive politics? Um, policy, policy writing to the point where you begin to to gather the information to come up with the policies up to implementation is a very expensive affair. And sometimes I I, I tend to believe that civil servants, because they do not know this, some of these things are new to them. They were being done at national level. But now here are county governments who have an old workforce with old mentality, who needs uh, capacity training. And when somebody understands what they need to do, they're probably going to do it. And if, uh, if, you know, if you get someone who does not understand what they need to do, they'll brush it aside because they do not want to be seen not knowing what to do. So like Olga said, um, if the international community can help work with county governments in some of these policy making processes, from up to, from collecting of, uh, of, of, of information to implementation, I think then uh, we will see some progress because funding is adequately low and again, intentionally so, so what do we do? Let's source for our friends who can help us walk this journey. And we bypass the systems that are trying to put the blockages and we, and we walk together and we see it to its uh, fulfillment. That's the implementation. For me, I think that's the, how the international community can help us. Uh, uh, can I add a bit more, uh, Helena? Uh, it, uh... I think one of the uh, most important thing as well that we need to think about is developing kind of a international network in order to facilitate what we call as a horizontal learning. I mean, um, uh, each local government from uh, different countries can learn each other, can learn from the good and best practices from other regions, from other countries. And if we can develop kind of this international network in order uh, to facilitate uh, kind of a co-learning, facilitate the horizontal learning, and then inspire, uh, try to inspire each other. Uh, it will be our kind of a great movement, not only movement in a country, but movement uh, we as a global citizen. Uh, well, we we all understand that the the inclusive citizenship is now is a challenging uh, is a kind of a challenge that only faced by one or two uh, countries it's different and the situation is different when we talk about the the old uh, aspect of our democratization or so on and so forth but now uh, uh, we see kind of a kind of a global challenge as well for sure and there is a difference so that's why uh, in this regard uh, 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 having kind of a, this group of a community in this group of people who are really working on and then try to inspire each other uh, in the aspect of horizontal learning will be good idea as well, I think. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah.
Um, uh, Helena, you are still muted, I think. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Wawa. <laughs> I can tell we're approaching the end of this of the webinar. Uh, thank you so much for uh, notifying me. Now, I was just saying that uh, since we're approaching the end of the seminar, so, so by way of conclusion, I would like to ask all of the panelists, so one by one, I'll be inviting you to comment on um, what are, say, like mention one next step that you will take when you go back to, to work, whether in Malmö or in Sweden or in Botswana or in Kenya or in Indonesia. Um, so what will be the next step you will take sort of in, based on an insight from this seminar? Uh, and I would also like you to comment on uh, if somebody would ask you like, well, what difference would it make to have truly inclusionary policies? Like, why is it important? Since it's democracy, International Democracy Day tomorrow, I think that your insights will be particularly welcome on that note. Um, I will invite um, Olga first to respond to those two questions in brief. Thank you. Um, what do I do from here? I think first and foremost, we have to like introspect, look at the policies that we have in place at local level, government that are exclusive so that we know where to fix. Sometimes it might not be the policies that are written in black and white by the actions and the, the procedures that we have in place. So those are the things that I really have to go and look down and sit with my team and see what is it that we can do to improve the services of the minority in our town. Uh, like Sergeant Redford said, you know, we have people living with disability in town. Uh, we have women that are not well represented when it comes to policy making and decision making. An example being my situation right now, being the only female man in the country and the only female councillor in my, in, my, in, my, in, my, in my town. So those are the things that we have to go and look and see the gaps, where we can fill in the gaps uh, going forward to make sure that all people are represented equally. Nobody's left behind. Because this is the, 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 our role as politicians. We are supposed to be the voice for the voiceless. Thank you. Sorry, I was muted again. <laughs> I apologize. Thank you so much, Olga, for uh, drawing the attention to speaking, sort of being the voice for the voiceless as a role of the politicians. Uh, so over to you, Carol, uh, just a brief comment to the two questions about your next step and uh, how you would expect why this matters, inclusive politics. Um, I will continue to engage the county governments to um, uh, redo the policy and um, see how it can be brought to the county assembly for for passing and allow us now to allow them to implement. And I just want to give a quick example. And I think one of the things that we really need is honesty. And that is something that is very um, um, rare in Africa, you know, honesty to do things that, you know, they're really, really are going to help the people. And I'll give an example of, um, there's a place when I was still in the county assembly that there, were, there was a lot of flooding. And we, we kept asking, why is this flooding? Uh, why is this still flooding? And yet we have partners, develop, uh, you know, development partners who want to help us to stop this flooding in this area. And we were told, because uh, it keeps bringing the money. So you see, there's, we need to be honest. As politicians, as government uh, civil servants, that we really, really want to address the issues that are before us. So I think those are the two things that we need. We need honesty and we need champions who are sincere, who really, really are have the heart of the, the groups that we're talking about to see them actually being empowered. So for me, I will continue to champion, I will continue to push, I will continue to look for development partners that can help us so that that policy, youth policy and children's policy, I didn't even touch on children because they're also, poly, we also want to do a children's policy, which I actually, um, I was the move of the motion in the county assembly because we cannot start building from the middle. We have to start building from the foundation. 
and children are the foundation. So that by the time they get to the youth, there's a synchrony. And by the time they go to adulthood, there's a synchrony. And so I will continue to champion for that in my council. Thank you so much, Carol. And over to you, Sergeant, for a, a very brief comment since we really want to end by 11.30 uh, or uh, in five minutes, that is. Um, so are you with us, Sergeant? Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, yeah going back to uh, what my people as a chairperson of Albinism Society of Botswana and as a, a, a member of the Central Committee from Alliance Pro progressives as a party is to go and and try to sell them the story so that they keep on uh, working on an issue of inclusive. I know it's hard, but the, it's very, very important to deal with the human rights for all. So we will keep on doing it as we've been trying to do it. Thank you so very much. Thank you so much, Sergeant. So over to you, Wawa, for a brief comment. Uh, education is one of the most important one in order to develop inclusive uh, citizenship and society. So that's why one of our um, uh, next step uh, after this research is bring all our experience, also findings into uh, a curriculum in the university teaching as well. So we will use this one as the way to give our students more understanding on how it is important so, because you know they will be our future leaders as well. And to the local community, we also are doing kind of a, some advocacy in order to uh, bring them into this mainstream of inclusive society as well. And why uh, this kind of thing important for us, I always believe that uh, the quality of democracy is not given. We have to fight, we have to struggle, and we have to put more and more in the effort in order to make it uh, sustain in the future. Thank you, Elena. Yeah. Thank you so much for reminding us of that. So I think I'll have to invite either Julia or Diana because there isn't time for both of you to speak if you just make a brief comment. Okay. I, well, um, I, I think just to make policy and law in, into reality, I think many, many of you have talked about it today and I think it's it's also um, uh, a point important to us. We have the law, we have the policy, but we have to make it uh, in reality. Yeah. Mm, thank you. So from, from policy to reality, that is indeed important. And last but not least, Shora, what is your brief sort of comment on next steps and uh, maybe why maybe the opposite of uh, what's happening in Malmo from reality to policy, actually having a democracy in the Iranian society. Mm. Yeah, a very good point. But thank you so much, all panelists. I think this was truly inspirational, not only on uh, relating to the topic of today, but also in relation to the fact that tomorrow we will, we will all be able to celebrate the International Day of Democracy. So the recording uh, of this webinar will be posted uh, at the ICLD website. It will also be shared with all um, registered listeners. And the research report, uh, which is published, will soon be accompanied by, by a policy brief at the ICLD uh, website. And um, on behalf of ICLD, I'd like to say that feel free to reach out to the International Center for Local Democracy with any questions, ideas, or reflections that you might have after this webinar. So again, on behalf on, um, of ICLD. Uh, I'd like to thank all panelists for sharing your insights and, and your knowledge. Um, and um, uh, to all participants for joining in uh, in uh, such a participatory manner and posting lots of questions. Uh, and as you can see in the chat, you, you get link, links there to the research report and um, uh, the contacts of uh, one of the organizers, uh, Clara or Stadius. I don't know if, I, if you want to say the final words, uh, Joanne. Um, if so, I'll hand over well, to you. Once again, yes, also say a very big thank you to you, Helena, who have been an excellent moderator for this uh, seminar. And thank you for all, uh, all um, panelists, of course, and with your strong contribution. We have been so uh, excited to listen to your uh, feedback and, and your very good insights. But also a big thank you to all participants. Take all this knowledge with you and be the change agents in your local 
uh, environment in your local society. So thank you so much, everyone, to be part of this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank bye you bye. so much, everyone. Thanks so much. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>